Hey, what's up runner? Coach Kyle here. And today I'm going to go through some recent research results so that you can be aware of this great information. Most importantly, come away from this video with some actionable knowledge on how to put it into place into your training to optimize it as much as possible. Today, I'm going to go over some research on cold laser therapy for soft tissue injury healing. Talk about how many calories you should be taking in during a marathon. Talk about some plant-based versus animal-based nutrition or protein research. Give you some info on self-talk so you can run faster and discuss branched chain amino acids and if they're a good supplement or not. If you don't know, I'm Coach Kyle. I work primarily with plant-based distance runners all over the world, optimizing their running, strength work, nutrition, bringing it all together with great accountability and motivation without asking them where they get their protein from. So speaking about protein, let's dive into it. When it came to the plant-based versus animal-based protein intake, tackling some big questions and related to this, probably heard that plant-based protein is less effective than animal-based for healing, for recovery, for muscle building. So researchers from this 2021 study had 24 healthy young males intake, ingest, 30 grams of plant-based protein from a wheat, corn, and pea blend, or 30 grams of milk protein. And so the important thing here is that thanks to the corn protein, which is high in leucine, both interventions were matched for this particular amino acid. And a big theory on why plant-based protein may be less effective for muscle building is simply because it may be lower in leucine, thus slightly less effectiveness of plant-based protein in general. So the results were that the milk group had a higher plasma, a central amino acid concentration, and a higher plasma leucine concentration. But the muscle protein synthesis per hour was actually higher after the plant-based protein ingestion by just a little bit. And so it's likely, or at least fairly plausible, I think that without the leucine from the plant-based corn in the protein, the results may have been fully for the animal-based protein supplement. In this case, it was basically a toss-up, which is fine with me. It really stresses the importance of eating a variety of plant-based foods from a variety of sources, especially in this supplement. Finding a blend that has a higher leucine source, uh, vital wheat gluten, seitan is all, also very high in leucine. Calories matched, tofu actually has more leucine than eggs. And as I said here, corn is a good source as well. You can also purchase just vegan leucine supplements, but I'm not sure I'd go that far. The big takeaway is that the increase in postprandial or after eating muscle growth, muscle protein synthesis response is as effective with this particular supplement as it was with milk. Branched chain amino acids or BCAA supplements are something you see around. They're not quite as popular as like just a protein supplement. So amino acids are broken down proteins basically and branched changed are a little different than just amino acids or essential amino acids, EAAs. Uh, those are the ones we can't make. But branched chain amino acid supplements are something that you see around, you know, mentioned here and there. The question always pops up, you know, in Reddit or on Twitter or in some Facebook groups, are branched chain amino acid supplements worth investing in, worth buying and using? And if you look at the bottle, <laughs> if you look at the supplement company website, yeah, branched chain amino acids are the shit. They are amazing and you should absolutely spend $35 on a, on a bottle of, of BCAA supplements. But if you look at the research, and so here we have a, a literature review. These scientists, bless their hearts, they have gone through the literature and they looked for studies that met their criteria and they determine, they look at, they determine are these supplements worthwhile for performance, for recovery, for strength. And with BCAAs, the answer is no. There might be some benefit there, but really the, the cost to benefit ratio is so bad. There's a plethora of things that you can do that are way better for bang for your buck than buying 
branch chain amino acid supplements. And so you can click on the literature review in the show notes to read more about it. I'm not going to go through that now, but if you want to learn more about, you know, wait, what can you do that is less or zero dollars and benefit your, your fitness more than BCAAs, pretty much anything. And so that's, that's how that works. If you take them and you notice some benefit, probably a placebo, or you might, you might just be not getting enough protein or calories in general throughout your, your daily nutritional intake. But as it comes down to it for supplementing BCAAs, don't waste your money. Okay, so here was a great study looking at intra-race nutritional strategies for marathon performance. And the really cool thing about this study was that it was done on non-elite runners. I think the average time was around four hours. And how it worked was they performed a 10K time trial seven weeks before the Copenhagen Marathon to get a fitness benchmark. Researchers divided the groups into the participants into two groups. Each group uh, kind of equalized based on 10K ability was given a different nutritional strategy. So one was given a freely chosen nutritional strategy, AKA they weren't told what to do. And the other group was given a scientifically based nutritional and hydration strategy, which roughly came out to about three gels and 20 ounces of water per hour along with a bit of sodium and caffeine. The results were that the average marathon time was almost 11 minutes faster on average, or about 5% faster for those who went into the race, who executed the race with a good nutritional strategy. I think they ran about, I think it was 349 was the average. Most importantly, there was no difference in gastrointestinal symptoms. So, you know, sometimes the concern is that you eat more, you're going to have more stomach problems. But this was not the case. They just ran faster. Okay, cool coach, Kyle. So how do we do that? <laughs> so here's how it worked. Here's how it went down. We're talking about 250 calories per hour. Came out to about 60, 70 grams of carbs per hour. So a little bit over 250, I think it was. So let's go over exactly what that looked like. Now in this study, the ad libitum group, or the group that just did whatever they thought was best, took in about a third fewer calories per hour than the faster group, and they took in about the same amount of water. So what the nutritional strategy group did based on the suggestions of the researchers was about 15 minutes before the marathon started, they took in two gels, about 200 calories, and they drank a glass of water. Easy peasy. And then 40 minutes into the marathon, they started taking in one gel every 20 minutes, and they drank about 20 or so liters of water per hour. And if you want to learn more about my favorite nutrition, my favorite gels and stuff like that, you can check out my video on that topic as well. I highly suggest you do so because clearly going into a marathon with a proper nutritional strategy is going to lead you to better performance. Now with cold lasers, if you've never heard of this before, it's an FDA approved treatment that uses low levels of light to apparently or hopefully stimulate healing. This is a literature review from 2014 that I want to talk about. It's not super, super new, but there hasn't been a ton of research since then um, on low light laser therapy. This literature did include 17 papers about short term treatments for muscle injuries. And they did find a general reduction in inflammation, stimulated growth of new blood vessels and improved muscle recovery. And it did suggest that, and I quote, excellent therapeutic response for the treatment of skeletal muscle injuries. Yet, and this is a big but, all of these papers were done on studies with animals. And while there is some cross application, it's not 100%. And so definitely further research needs to be done on low light laser therapy, low power laser therapy for humans in human trials. There was one done on back pain in Brazil that found no benefit over the placebo. However, yesterday, a friend of mine who's a PT said that for diabetic neuropathy, there has been some good research on that and low grade laser therapy. So the research on self-talk uh, is pretty interesting and not one I would particularly like to be part of. The research has shown and through studies where they will put the participants in 
really cold water and study how the self-talk affects these participants' pain tolerance. Actually, it might be kind of interesting. They found that self-talk does definitely help you tolerate more pain. And so having a mantra for your track workouts, for races, being aware of talking to yourself, self-motivation does help you out during hard efforts. And so for example, telling yourself during track week workouts, during time trials, during that last half mile of a 5K, telling yourself that you can do it to harden the fuck up, to run harder, to run faster, does help. And interestingly enough, research that includes swear words in this self-talk does tend to be more effective than not including swear words. So be okay cursing at yourself during that last half mile of the 5K or the marathon. You know, telling yourself that you can do it and actually telling yourself from an outside point of view saying, come on, you can do this versus I can do this. You can do this tends to be a little more effective than I can do this, I can do this. And so go about it that way and practice this during your workouts, during that last lap of the last mile of the three by one mile repeat workout. Do it during training so you remember to do it during races. But keep in mind that doing this does help you. It will help you run that last half mile faster if you put it into practice.